Hi, my name is Stuart Lynch, and this is the third video in the Swift Data series. In the first video, we covered all the CRUD operations for Swift Data. And in the last video, we explored different ways in which we could create model containers, including a preview container so that we could view and display some mock data in our previews. Well, in this video, we'll take it one step further, and we'll focus on dynamic sorting and filtering of our data. I love getting your feedback, so tap the thumbs up button if you enjoyed this video and leave a comment below. Make sure you subscribe to the video and ring that bell to get notifications of new videos. And if you want to support my work, you can buy me a coffee. If you completed the project from the second video, you can continue along with me from there. If not, you can download the completed project from the second video underscore containers and mock data branch in the GitHub repository. I've got a link listed in the description below. In my project, I've created a new branch called the third video underscore dynamic query and sort for this video. In the first video, we used a query macro to fetch all of our books, and we used the book title key path as the sort order for our books. You see that in the preview. They're all sorted by the title. Well, we can change that key path here and sort by author, and the sort changes automatically. That's pretty good. Now I have one more property that I'd like to sort on, though, and that's the status. However, when I change the key path to status, I get this error that the macro query requires that status conform to comparable. And do I want to use a raw value? Oh, okay, so let's change that to a raw value then. This time the preview crashes. And this is an issue that you'll get if you use an enum as one of your properties and you want to either sort or filter. Swift Data will store the enum's raw value just fine, but the query macro doesn't know how to sort. And in fact, we'd also find that we can't filter either on this property. So we're going to have to go back to do some refactoring. So let's switch back to the sorting by author or title for now and come back to this once we've fixed it. Well, our enum does have a raw value, which is an int, and that's what gets stored. So I'm going to go back to my model definition here where I define the status, and instead of making it of type status, I'm going to change that to status.rawValue. I could have just as easily used int because that's the actual type, but I like this because it's showing me that the status is really connected to some enum. To fix our init, I need to change where our status property is initialized. I'm still going to accept an enum when the object is created, but when I assign it to our status property, I'm going to have to use the raw value. The icon computed property no longer works because the status is an int now, but we can switch on that status enum that is derived from the raw value. And of course, we're going to have to force unwrap, and that's not an issue here. In edit book view, we have three errors because of this change. Our picker is still using the status enum, so when we update the item, we'll need to use the status's raw value instead. In the onAppear function, we'll need to derive the enum from the book status's int value, and force unwrapping again here is just fine. And similarly, when we need to update the change computed property, we'll have to do the same thing. Our app should now compile fine, and our preview works fine too. I can change our query now to sort on book.status, that key path, and indeed, we see that it's sorted by that status. However, if I run the app, the app crashes. And that's because we've changed our status property from an enum to an int, and our Swift data's underlying code recognizes and cannot deal with that change. The previews work fine because every time we initialize our preview, we're initializing a new container, and that has no history or memory. If you delete the app and run again, though, you'll find that we don't get a crash. However, we've lost our old data. Now for us, this isn't really much of an issue because we have not released the app yet and we are still in development. However, if we were to have updated this app with this kind of change, everyone who has the app installed will crash 
And if they delete the app, they'll lose all their data too. So we'll have to look at, in that case, a migration. Now, it's a little too early in our Swift data journey to cover that for now, but I definitely will get to that later in the series. So let me just add a new book now, though, and see that nothing is broken. Let me change the status, too. Okay, we're back on track. Testing and refactoring your code is something that you'll be continually doing throughout your career in development. It's important that you keep your skills up to date and never become complacent. There's always something more to learn. And there's no better way to do that than with Brilliant, the sponsor of this video. With Brilliant, you can learn skills in ways that won't cost you thousands of dollars or take years of schooling. Now, it's important not to put all of your eggs in one basket, so to speak. And take it from me, your career will venture down very many paths. So take advantage of what Brilliant has to offer in the areas of math, data science, and computer science. You can learn in a fun, interactive way with thousands of lessons, basic to advanced topics. With Brilliant, you can customize the content to fit your needs, and it lets you solve problems at your own pace, and more topics are added every month. So take some time to explore what Brilliant has to offer, and have some fun doing so. You can try everything Brilliant has to offer, free for 30 days by visiting brilliant.org slash Stuart Lynch. A link is in the description, so click now, and the first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Let's move on now then to dynamic sorting. Well, what I'd like to do now then is to give the user the ability to choose their sort order. And for that, I'm going to create a picker. So for that picker, I'm first going to return to our book list view and create an enum here that I'll call sort order. And I'll make it a string, identifiable, and case iterable, so we can create a picker out of it. And there'll be three cases, status, title, and author. And then to conform to the identifiable protocol, we'll make the ID property a computed property of self, just returning self. Let's create a variable then called sort order that will be one of these sort orders, and I'm going to default it to status. Now, as this is the first item in a navigation stack, we can create our picker. We can leave an empty string for the label, but we'll bind the selection to the sort order. And then within that picker, we can create a for each loop and use the sort orders all cases because we made it case iterable. That'll provide us with a sort order that we can use in the creation of our text view for our display. And in that case, we'll use the text view using the string sort by. And then we'll use string interpolation to generate the sort order's raw value. And then our tag will tag it back to the sort order, the int. And then we'll set a button style to bordered. Well, our picker now allows us to change the sort order, but it's not doing anything in this section yet. Now the problem is that our query macro is sorting by a fixed key path, and we want this to be dynamic based on the selection made. In order to do this, though, we'll have to move the query and its listing to its own separate view so that we can reinitialize the query every time a selection is made. So we'll create a new Swift UI view, and I'm going to call it book list. I'll import Swift data. And this view is going to contain all of the code for our listing, including the deletion of items from the list, as well as the sort order. So if we're going to delete, we'll need to have access to the model context. And we can get that from the environment. And we're going to put our query right in this view. So for the time being, we're going to move the environment's context property and the query to this view. And I'll change the query shortly. So I'll cut out the entire group, return to book list, and replace the entire body with that group. Now back in book list view where we cut out that group, we can present book list. Well, the preview in book list view works great, but the book list itself isn't displaying any content. 
And that's because we have no preview container. But we can fix this in the same way that we learned in the last lesson. First, we'll create a preview object using the preview struct, passing in book.self as our model. Then we can call that add examples function for the preview to pass in that static book sample books array. And then finally, we can return the book list and call the model container method on this view, providing that preview container. Now, if we embed this book list in a navigation stack in the preview and return it, we get a fully functional view now. So now we can work on that passing in a specific sort order. Well, in book list, we can remove the sort from our query, and it'll just fetch the entire list of books in no particular order. In fact, it's unpredictable. We'll want to pass in a sort selection, which is the enum. So let's create an initializer for this view that will allow us to pass in that enum and update our query macro accordingly. So it's an initializer that will receive a sort order of type sort order. Then within that initializer, we can determine our sort order. When the case is a status, I'm going to want to sort on both the status and title. So I can't use that single key path that we have in the past. But what we can do is create an array of what are called sort descriptors that takes in a comparable key path instead. So let's create a property called sort descriptors that is an array of these sort descriptor types, but we'll have to specify what model type we want to be able to sort on, and that is a book. Now we can use the new inline switch that was introduced this year, so we can switch on sort order to get all three cases. For status, our array will be two sort descriptors. First, we'll sort on the book status, and then secondly, we'll sort on title. For the title, we can just use a single sort descriptor on sorting on book.title. And similarly for author, we'll use a sort descriptor that sorts on book author. But we can use this then to update our query macro for books. And we do that by placing an underscore in front of books. And then we can specify our query without the at sign and then pass in our sorts sort descriptors. To fix the preview, then, we'll need to specify an example sort order. So let's use status. And then back in the book list view, we'll need to update the call to the book list by passing in our sort order. Great. Now we can sort by any choice that we want. Now that we've got sorting going on, let's take a look at filtering. If we have a lot of books, it would be really nice if we had a way to search for by matching some kind of a string on either the author or the title. And this is perfect for the SwiftUI searchable method. So let's return to the book list view. And I'm going to add a state property that we can use for our searches text field and initialize it initially as an empty string. So we'll call that filter. Then I'm going to attach to the book list view a searchable modifier where the text will be bound to that filter variable. And for the prompt, we can use a text view with the string filter on title or author. Now the filtering will actually be done on the books in our book list, which is that other view that we created. So we'll need to pass that filter string on in the initializer. So while we're here then, let's add another argument to book list, and I'll call it filter string, and pass in that filter. Now, of course, book list doesn't have an initializer for that filter. So within that book list view, let's add to the init a filter string, which is of type string. And then we can fix the preview by providing an empty string for that filter string. Well, Swift Data uses a new predicate macro to filter our data loaded within the query. 
So to define a predicate, we'll also need to specify the type we are filtering on. So in our case, that's going to be a book. So we'll create a predicate using the macro predicate for a book. And that's going to provide us with a book as an iterator that we can use in our filter comparison. So for example, we only want to return or filter books if we can create a comparison that is true. So for example, if the book title contains our filter string, or our book author contains that filter string. The problem here is though that contains and other string comparisons are case sensitive. So, so book with a capital B is not the same as book with a lowercase b. Now if we were filtering an array using an array filter function, we could use the lowercase function on the book title and the book author. Unfortunately though, we're told here that the lowercase function is not supported in a predicate. Fortunately though, we have an alternate that does, and that's the localized standard contains method. And this is especially good because it'll make comparison case insensitive, and it'll also handle different type of characters that you have with accents in other languages. And that's going to become very useful for us when we do our localization. So this will handle filtering on the title, but we also want to return a book if the author contains the filter string. So we can add an or here and repeat that for author contains that string. If we left it like this though, when we have an empty string, nothing's going to be returned until we type something into the search field. So I'll need to add one more or here, and that's to return every book if the filter string is empty. Well, with that in place now then, we can simply add another argument to our query that we've already got set up for that sort order, and that's a filter argument, and it's the first argument in this initializer, and it needs a predicate, which we have. So if I return to now to our book list view, we can see that the filter field is empty and we're seeing all books. But as we type in the search field, it's looking for books or authors that contain that string. So for example, if we search on the string BL, I see I get both the author, Gilles Blunt, and the book title, Blackout. But as soon as I add an A, all I get is a match on the title. Similarly, if I just search for LAW, I get the book written by the author, John Lawton. Well, that completes section one, the three videos of this Swift data series. It's pretty basic, but we've covered all CRUD operations, containers and container previews, and dynamic queries where we can specify a sort order and a filter to filter down our query results. All we have, however, is a basic book model. In the next section in this series of videos, we'll be looking at relationships, where an individual book can have several quotes from that book, and we'll have page numbers for those quotes. So this is going to be a one-to-many relationship. But we'll also be able to add another model called genre and specify that a book can have multiple genres. But each genre can be associated with many books. And this is known as a many-to-many -many relationship. So I hope you stick with me on this Swift data journey.